three, two. My name is Erica Dewan. I'm the author of the new book, Digital Body Language. And my best advice is writing clearly is the new empathy. Writing clearly is the new empathy. Ooh, I like that. We're going to unpack that in a little bit. But Erica, first, I'm so glad you're here. Congratulations on an awesome, awesome book. Thank you for sending over a PDF so that I could get behind it and read it. Holy crap. It is Thank an awesome you so book. Much, Phil. Yeah. Woohoo. I'm super excited for you. So, and I'm super excited you're here. So tell me, right, you when we when we talked a couple weeks ago, maybe mm -hmm. a month ago, you said nobody thought this was important years ago. And now it's like this is all we got. So so take me through kind of how that because I know that this is this is not that you didn't do good work before, but this is your best work. This is really awesome. And so talk me through that. Like when people say, well, no, I, I don't think digital body language is important. What does that mean? Why would anybody say that? About six years ago, when I after I launched my first book, Get Big Things Done, The Power of Connectional Intelligence, I traveled the world helping CEOs and leadership teams build 21st century collaboration skills, especially for a world with virtual, global, multi-generational and matrix teams. But as I was focusing on really 21st century teamwork, I kept hearing the same challenges and questions from groups. Why is there so much misunderstanding at work today? Why are my teams feeling so anxious? How do we better connect across different ages and working styles? And one of the biggest challenges I discovered well before the pandemic was that there was no rule book for how we connect in a digital world, especially with research showing about 75% of communication is our nonverbal body language. How do we replace that in a world where up to 70 to 100% now of communication can be virtual? I set on a path about four years ago to study and investigate what I call a digital body language and how I believe it is a critical competitive advantage to leading, communicating, and selling in our modern marketplace. During that journey, uh, back in 2016, I remember talking to publishers about it. And basically most people said, no one needs a digital communications book, or isn't this a little bit too niche? But I stayed true to my passion, uh, you know, and what I have found was an experience I never would have imagined. But today, what I've discovered in my research that's in my book is that digital body language isn't just an additive to traditional body language anymore. It's actually just as, if not more important than our traditional body language today. And it will change how you get heard, how you get respected, how you sell and market in today's world. And in fact, digital body language is changing our own physical body language now. And I can talk more about that with Phil with you if you'd like. Ooh, I love that. I, I love that. We'll definitely, we'll definitely unpack that more. But you got to talk about this empathy word, because I have to say, when we moved into this COVID thing, I was VP of sales training for a software company. And the number one thing that we told our team was, hey, you need to be more empathetic with your customers. Well, what does that actually mean, Erica? How do we actually do it without saying, oh, boy, that really sucks. You got COVID, too, or whatever. Right. How do we actually unpack that and be more empathetic? I'll start with a story that really taught me a lot about empathy. Uh, I grew up in a you know conservative neighborhood outside of Pittsburgh uh, to an Indian immigrant family. My parents came uh, from India in their twenties and settled on the you know the new life in American dream. And right after 9/11 uh, happened, I was in high school coming back from a soccer practice, and my father was waiting for me at a local community center. And right after 9-11, during that time, someone, um, while he was waiting for me, called the police on my father, who was a local cardiologist, because he looked suspicious. And I'll never forget the moment where I walked out of the, the sports practice and saw my father being frisked by police officers. And I saw his palms wide open, his direct eye contact, his deference and respect to the officers. And I remember driving home that day with my father and being so angry, angry at him for being, you know, almost a bit too respectful of for what I saw as racial profiling and ignorance. Uh, but my father said something really important that day. He said to me, Erica, body language saved my life. And he said, you know, wouldn't it be helpful to think and put yourself into other people's shoes? My father had deep empathy for 
what some people were really experiencing in that moment, a sense of fear of those that looked different than them. And I, I think that that taught me that empathy is all about stepping into the shoes of another. Now in a digital world, what I really learned is just as I was an immigrant learning the importance of traditional body language in my upbringing, today we are all immigrants to the new world of digital body language. And with the lack of body cues in the same way, even on a video screen, we're only seeing about 50% or even you know 30% of body language signals we need to reimagine how we connect. And today, that means things like writing clearly is the new empathy, being thoughtful of our messages, designing our video meetings for engagement, and reimagining that valuing others is about valuing their time, their inboxes, and even their schedules. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I love that. When I read that story about your dad in the book, I was like, oh my gosh, like I, I can, I would be just like you. I would have been just as indignant. Like what in the heck? Like how does that happen? But your dad was right. I mean, by being aware of how other people are and how we are, right? How we come across, we can absolutely save our life and probably de-escalate. Not, not every situation. Let's be really clear. Certainly yeah. there are situations that doesn't happen, but a lot of times we can take someone who's super hostile with us and turn them into a fan. But now that we're digital, I mean, 30%, Erica, how do we, how do we actually do that? I mean, if, if we're on video, I mean, is there like, the, I've been told or I've heard that, you know, use it, making sure that we, our hands are visible often breaks people yes. down, right? It makes them more comfortable. So for me, like I, I actually, I take that seriously. Like I try to keep my hands up, move them around a little bit, just so people see like, I'm nothing to hide, right? I'm, I'm here and open. You're not multitasking. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unless I'm off camera, right? Like writing notes on here. Um, but for sure, that's the whole goal. So how, how do we how do we do that? Like, how do we do that digitally? Um, you said writing clearly. So let's maybe start there, right? Writing clearly. What does that even mean? And how do we practice that? Because I, like I said, I've heard that. But show me, give me some practical, tactical stuff. Let's talk about what empathy means in the world of digital body language. In emails, it means simply being thoughtful of subject lines, not being brief, but being clear, making sure that people know in your messages exactly what to do and by when and who's involved, not sending uh, you know, FYI emails where people don't know whether they need to act on it, whether they should do something with it, uh, being thoughtful uh, when you receive messages to not rush through it and not answer the three things and only answer one of the things and not reading into one line, but assuming good intent and always asking and responding with clarity. In today's world, it's a lot harder to receive and send those messages. If we were face to face in the room, we might adjust our language if we knew someone was on the verge of tears versus someone who is completely surprised and excited. So taking that extra step, especially in our written formats, chat, IM, texting, email, to think before we type and always have a communicate your mind mindset to make sure you share your emotions and, and know that what was implicit in traditional body language now has to be explicit in digital body language. Bill, should we move to video, on video Ooh, Zoom calls now? Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? I, I think that's important because let, let, you talked subject line, right? But now we're video, right? Now it's me and you, we're right here on video. So how do we do that? Yeah, how do, how do we make sure that our we get the point across without coming across as a jerko? So let me start with actually some video body language tactics. And then I'm gonna talk about how you can actually master empathy in the design of your entire meeting, especially as a meeting host. So a, a few key uh, video digital body language tips. The first tip is when you are presenting, you can't do this all the time, but when you are presenting, I recommend looking into the camera at least 60% of the time. A study showed uh, by quantified analytics that we are making eye contact directly face to face about 30 to 60% of the time. We want to reinforce that even more. The reality is, is we can't see others when we're looking to the camera, but they can feel neurologically a greater connection to us. The second thing, just like you said, Phil, you want to be far away from the camera so people can see your hand gestures, but not too far that they can't see your facial expressions. Number three, always arrive prepared on time and thoughtful. Uh, if you are the meeting host, be sure to send agendas in advance so that everyone knows why they're there, why they need to be included, uh, maximizing the quality of the time you spend. 
during the meeting. Start with simple phrases like, here's what success looks like at the end of the meeting. Here's why, you know, I need all of you con to contribute. And if we are able to get through this in 15 minutes, we'll end the meeting 10 minutes early. That will quickly avoid uh, Zoom fatigue and multitasking. And then during the meeting, think about how you can proactively engage introverts, extroverts, those of different personality styles. One of my clients has a process using good digital body language where she sends the agenda in advance and says, I want everyone to be ready to answer these questions. And then during the medium, she use, uses varied spaces. She says, you know, I'd like everyone to share their answers in the chat first. She has everyone share or on a virtual whiteboard. And then she calls on people that have the most different or diverse ideas. This does a few things. First of all, it allows her introverts to actually share and have time to process. Introverts often think better in writing. They were already struggling for airtime in the face-to-face -face office, but they have time to process. They're not on the spot. And it secondly allows the meeting host to avoid groupthink, to often calling on the same three people to start a discussion. This reduces bias and ensures that she's calling on people that have the most diverse ideas. And then the last thing I recommend for your uh, video meetings is at the end of the meeting, make sure you're doing a quick summary of who is doing what by when, how each person is taking ownership forward. And then immediately after the meeting, I recommend within 30 minutes of the meeting, send a quick meeting recap, an email. You could assign a note taker for this. I like to say the quick meeting summary email is like the new virtual handshake. It solidifies that everyone's on the same page and knows what to do next. Those are just simple tips that are not just good productivity practices. They are practices in empathy in today's world. Empathy of people's time, schedules, and thoughtfulness so that everyone is not wasting time in chronic cancellations and endless you know, replays of reply all emails, but doing the work that matters for all. Ooh, I, I love that. There's so much there to unpack, so much we could talk about, but I think your, your best tip there is the quick meeting summary is the new handshake and that you don't have to do it by yourself. I think that's really great uh, to remind us that we can assign someone for that. Perhaps one of those introverts who wants to contribute and we know they wanna step up, but we can let them do that in a way that's safe for them, that's comfortable for them uh, without demeaning them and saying, no, no, you're the secretary. No, no, I need you to do the most important thing. I need you to be the handshaker around the room doing that digital in a way that makes you comfortable. I think that's that's awesome. That's such a great idea. Erica. New alignment in our in our modern hybrid market. And even if we go, as we go back to the office, we're going to have team members in the room. Half of them are going to be coming in on video screens. So we have to build this skill now. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's so good. That's so good. I I just love that. I, I so much of that is so often overlooked here that that we that we miss it. I mean, there's a reason that your book, I, I know it's not out yet, but I'm sure people are going to love this book. I mean, digital body language is fantastic. You have so much in it. So let's let's move. You, you talk ab about in the book, you talk about culture in a very different way than I've seen others talk about, especially as it relates to how we communicate via email. You, you have a study, uh, story in there about how someone got upset because they went right to the person and ask them to do something and that upset them. Can you unpack that and explain that a little more, please? Tell us that story. Hey, yes, in, uh, in part three of the book, I decode the differences in digital body language across genders, generations, and even cultures. And one of the stories uh, that I talk about in the chapter called Lost in Translation, Cultural Differences, was a story about a, uh, a team member in San Francisco that was sending his colleague in India uh, a work request, a peer, a work request related on a shared project that they were working on. But when he sent this work request to his peer in India, he discovered that his peer in India's boss named Arvind was actually very upset. And the reason was the cultural norm in India is if you have a work request for someone, you have to first go through the boss, CC the boss in that country that will then share it with their team member. India has often, not only in traditional body language, but even in digital, there are some common norms around how work gets done and who needs to be CC'd on messages. Whereas for that San Francisco teammate, it was just the way of working to connect with a peer. This is just one example of how 
even uh, our digital body language behaviors are different in different countries, similar to regional accents or dialects we have in, in traditional body language. Certain cultures do handshakes. In Western cultures, other, others will may have a prayer sign. We have different digital body language differences. I'll give you one more example. One leader in the UK talked about how months later he discovered his Brazilian colleagues thought he was a rude person because he would often start his emails with, unfortunately, uh, or use ending signatures like best regards. And for his Brazilian colleagues who often used emojis and exclamations and emotive language, which is very much Brazilian culture, they just thought he was a rude and off-putting person. But really he was just being British. Wow. Wow. So so we have to we we have to be aware of emojis and exclamation points and signatures and salutations oh my goodness gracious that's so much to think about yet and how do we get anything else done if we're so like focused on making sure that we're communicating in a in a positive way don't worry phil i wrote the playbook so hopefully by the end of the book you'll know exactly what to do and i really break it down in a simple way know your audience we are not all the same and we can't assume that others will completely get are the digital body language signals we send uh, and that we're reading theirs in the most effective way. So here's a simple way to make sure that you're being thoughtful and conscious of your digital body language given some of these dynamics. In all of our communications, we are answering two questions that shapes our digital body language. The first question is, how much power is between us? Does this person have more power or less power? This shapes how formal we are, how detailed we are, how quickly we respond whether you know we send a one-liner or uh, we call them versus we try to schedule something on their calendar. And understanding power dynamics can be helpful to know whether to throw in that emoji or whether to wait until you get to know someone a little bit more uh, before you start to you know, show some of your uh, punctuation style. The second question we're always answering is how much trust is between us? Are we colleagues that have worked together for years or is this a new relationship of someone that I'm trying to sell something to? And again, once you've navigated trust levels, you can think about not only what you may signal right now, but how you wanna grow that over time. And the reality is, is I'm a big promote, proponent of being authentic, you know, showcasing who you are, but at the same time being cognizant of knowing your audience and how to infuse tone and nuance in ways that make the most sense. Awesome. That makes that makes a lot of sense, and you did write the playbook, of course, right? And that's that's super helpful. Let's let's talk about the the, the silent. You talk about that in the book. I, I've never heard the Chinese axiom that you talk about that the loudest duck gets shot. That's so interesting how that plays. So talk about silence, especially digitally, because it it's so different. So many people they want to be loud or they want to feel like they're heard, and yet we have so many that are just the opposite and they want to just listen and take it in. So what what's that all about? I, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, an author named Laura Liswood wrote a book called The Loudest Duck. And it was all about the bias that we often experience in meetings. The research in the book showed that the first roughly three people, two to three people that speak in a meeting often guide the rest of the agenda. Usually those are extroverts or the most senior people. Um, so we're missing out on about 80% of cognitive insights and diversity in meetings. And this was all face-to-face -face, pre pandemic. Uh, what I really set out to do in my new book, Digital Body Language is to ask, you know, how are some of these meeting dynamics playing out in a digital world? And what I discovered was that uh, many of these challenges are amplified online. We are even more likely to jump to the two or three people. We are less comfortable in silence. We feel it's much more awkward in a Zoom call. So we rush to fill in the spaces or say, are you on mute? Uh, versus actually giving time for people to think. Uh, you know, in, in, in the Chinese culture, a common axiom is the loudest duck gets shot. But in Western culture, you know, the common axiom is speak now or forever hold your peace. And if you think about those two, and then you think 20 years later, growing up with those mindsets, and I was very much, I grew up in that mindset more of the Chinese culture from an Indian upbringing of being quiet and reserved and only speaking up when you're told. You think about that in 
a, a corporate workplace, it can be obvious who are certain people that are more likely to get promoted and heard versus others simply because of those backgrounds. So as a team leader, what's really critical for you to do is make sure you're creating varied spaces, as I talked about earlier, for people to think. You know, take exercises, even on video calls, and say, I'm going to give everyone four minutes to think. It's going to feel awkward on a Zoom call, but I want you to write down your thoughts. And then I want you to summarize them in two lines and put them in the chat. You'll avoid turn taking. You'll reduce the visual and, and bias of who speaks first. And you'll create a, you know, a, a better way of really leveraging the intellectual diversity of thinking on your team and then going into dialogue around what are some of the common themes, what's different, or using breakout rooms. Wow. So that that's so interesting that we would break it down like that. I, I've never, I've actually never been in a meeting, Erica, where anybody's ever done that where anybody's ever said, right, let's let's write things down and then come back with our two or three things that we share in chat instead of being loud. That's, that's super interesting. The research actually shows that we are better collaborators. If we each have our own individualized thinking first, pre the meeting, and then come to the meeting with that individualized thinking. So we're not just coming to the meeting and saying, let's brainstorm, what do you think? That is a terrible way to get actual brainstorming. Uh, it cr often creates groupthink. Instead, send the questions in advance, have everyone prepare, and then come with their individualized thoughts in unison. Mm. Mm. I like that. That's, I've, I've, uh, I, I mean, that's typically why I've tried to send meeting agendas out early to give people a chance to, you know, come up with that. But I've never explicitly said, and come with your thoughts, because most people don't. They they take the meeting and then they show up like sixty seconds before. Yeah. And the first thing they do is, okay, so what does this one mean? Or, hey, maybe this one is good. And then to your point there, then it is the loud person, not the quiet person that ever gets their points through. Yeah. That's interesting. Wow. Wow. That's cool. So, so, so what if you are that loud person like, well, like me, right? Who probably talks too much and probably isn't as introspective as he needs to be. How do we get out of our comfort zone? And how do we make that um, you know, more available for us in that practice? Because I read about, you know, you talk about getting out of your comfort zone, but I really want to ask more about that and how like how that actually plays out, because that's the hardest thing for me is to 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 kind of subvert how I am and to be somebody else, right? Well, first of all, you know, Phil, I think you are a great role model for giving other people a voice to share through this show and, and through the community that you've built. So I want to give lots of props to you that you're already doing a lot of great things. Uh, but if you are someone that is maybe a bit more vocal and wants to make sure you're creating safe spaces for others to speak up, here are a few quick things that will help. The first is similar to what I discussed before, create very mediums for people to speak up. Some may thrive in video calls to share out loud. Others may thrive in writing, like in the chat. Uh, and I mentioned introverts specifically. One of my clients had a process where after her Monday morning weekly meeting, she said, if you have an idea or thought that comes out after this, I want you to send it to me on Friday. It actually forced her team to think for four days. And she stopped just rewarding the people who were fastest to respond to her and prioritize thoughtfulness and getting all those insights on Friday versus just speed. Another thing that you can do is simply pass the megaphone. Call on people you haven't heard from. Have different people run different parts of the meeting. So instead of you always being the host, switch up the mode. Even simple things like having everyone rotate and starting with a quick icebreaker. It's only a five minute thing, like 12 to 12.05 at the beginning of a meeting. It ends at 12.05, so if someone comes late, they miss it. And it gives people a varied space to showcase their authentic self. And in some of these simple practices, like pass the megaphone, switching up the different mediums and using authentic icebreakers can go a long way in creating those spaces for each other to speak up. The last thing is hopefully have a book club, read digital body language and talk to each other about what you noticed, uh, what's working in our digital landscape and what isn't working for you. And sometimes you may be surprised by what you realize. Can I share one story on that, Phil? Absolutely. One story that really opened my eyes to the importance of checking our bias is uh, uh, by a woman named Lainey, who is an executive at Citigroup. She's on a global steering committee. And 
her steering committee has four people. She is in New York. She has a team member in the UK, a team member in Sydney, Australia, and a team member in Argentina. And while she was regularly on these calls, she realized that she wasn't hearing from her colleague in Argentina much at all. And she just kind of assumed that maybe he wasn't as engaged. Maybe he didn't care about it. Maybe he was multitasking. But finally, she got the courage to message him about it during the meeting. And he said, I'm having such a hard time translating three different English accents, a New York accent, a London accent, and an Australian accent at the exact same time. This was not on her radar, but if we check our bias and realize that other people may be struggling in ways we don't even realize, we can create better cultures of clarity. And, and the simple practice she took on was making sure that those written meeting notes were very clear, were summarized at the end, uh, and checking in with him more regularly during the meeting to make sure everyone was on the same page. Wow, I love that. That's that's so important and yet so overlooked. Something we can do. You've got some great templates in the book for us to do that with as we look through, right? I've read some of those. I'm like, oh yeah, I can do that. I can put that into practice. I love that about your book, Erica. So thank you for including those for those of us that that are aware of maybe our, our, uh, our biases, but you also then give us an exercise that I thought was interesting. Towards the end of the book, you give us an exercise for actually getting feedback if maybe we're not so aware. Can, so can you step through that here as we get close to wrapping this one up? Yes, I have a lot of exercises uh, in the guidebook portion of digital body language, but a couple of them that I, I think that would be useful for you is one of them is, um, what your colleague can tell you about your digital body language. And I lay out four different characters, Alice, Betty, Charlie, and Dan. And I talk about uh, asking your team to read those different styles of individuals and then naming which one you are. And this is a great way for you to understand how others receive your messages as well as making sure that you're avoiding some pitfalls. And let me give you some examples. In my book, I really decode that we are not all the same. There are different digital body language styles. On one end, there are individuals that I would call digital natives. They love shorthand, text, I am, they're fast, you know, in responses. On the other end, we have what I call digital adapters. These are people that I think are, I would call immigrants to the world of digital body language. They have more reluctance. They still, they can't wait to get back to face-to-face -to -face offices. If I were to summarize it, my father is a digital adapter and I'm a digital native. When he sends me a text message, it starts with Dear Erica and ends with Love Dad. And I have to scroll through it because it's as long as a letter. And I haven't quite taught him that a text is not the same as a letter, but it's just an example of the fact that we are not all the same. And in the guidebook, you can understand not only what are some things you should be conscious of, uh, whether you're a native, an adapter, or what I call a chameleon, someone in between, but how you have the patience and the understanding of, to, of how to connect with those that are different than you. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there's so much in there. I, I love it. Your, your book is fantastic. It helped me a lot. I'm still working through a lot of it because it's so meaty. So, and I mean that in a wonderful way. Like there's so much there. If I just take a couple of those practices, Erica, it's going to help folks just immensely because I know it has helped me. So is there any other thing, if there's one thing that maybe you haven't shared or maybe you want to reinforce something that you did that people should really take away from digital body language that they can use either to get started or to really up their game a whole nother level, what would that be? I think the final thing I'd love to share, I already talked about how writing clearly is the new empathy. And I talked a bit about how reading carefully is the new listening. The last key tip I'd love to share is a phone call is worth a thousand emails. Knowing when to change the channel, when to not have 30 person Zoom meetings, when to get on the phone one on one, when to not have a culture of reply alls and, and just really connect with those you need to connect with can go a long way to create cultures of connection in this changing time. Wow, I love that. I do my best to pick up the phone and actually talk to people or get on a Zoom call or do something because I do find it short circuits so much and I can actually feel the other person instead of just reading into it like I'm prone to do. So that's uh, <laughs> that's really, really helpful. 
So cool. Well, Erica, I love your book. I'm super excited. I hope people get it. I put some exclamation points at the end of this because I think people need to get it, right? Digital Body Language is a great book, folks. It is packed full of exercises and examples and all these great things that you can do to actually communicate more. Erica talks about writing clearly is the new empathy. And she breaks down some of those email examples that she talked about here as we're sharing in the book all about video digital body language, which I'm working on myself as we go here. And I'm just so grateful, Erica, that you took some time today to share with us because there's so much in the book. We could talk for hours about it. So congratulations and thanks for spending some time with me today. Thank you so much, Phil, for creating this space for other uh, authors and thought leaders. We continue to learn from you and how you role model great connection and digital body language and thanks to your whole community i hope you'll check out the book engage talk about it and share it gift it to your bosses and even your kids yeah absolutely and get this for your sales team folks it is absolutely a game changer for you so if you need to write it you want more from erica you go to erica dewan.com that's e-r-i-c-a-d-h-a-w-a-n.com and i'll make sure i link that up in the notes and again Erica, thanks so much. You're the best. I appreciate you. you.